Welcome to New Brighton, a popular seaside resort located just across the Mersey from the city of Liverpool. Lying on the northeastern tip of the Wirral Peninsula, New Brighton is a hugely popular place for people to visit from around the Merseyside area, famed for its beaches, a captivating 19th century coastal fort and the longest seaside promenade in Britain. On this walk around New Brighton on this windy morning, we'll explore the main sites of this seaside settlement. And where better to begin than on New Brighton's famous beach? Here, we're on the eastern flank of the Wirral Peninsula opposite Liverpool. And here on the beach, we can see the ruins of what appears to be a much older pirate ship, embedded within the sand on this wide open shoreline. A popular spot for families and other visitors on a day out in New Brighton, this is the Black Pearl Driftwood Pirate Ship, which dates all the way back to the year 2013. So the Black Pearl is a fairly new landmark of this seaside town, and it was built out of driftwood by two artists, Frank Lund and Major Mace. Now despite only being nine years old this year, the Black Pearl Pirate Ship has had a dramatic history, having started out its life as a more substantial ship replica, but over the years having been battered by storms, and in some cases, even swept out to sea. After many trials and tribulations, however, the ship has been rebuilt on numerous occasions, and at this point in its still short history, its pirate flag is still flying strong above a structure mostly covered by sand. But as we now make our way along New Brighton's beach, why exactly did those two artists, Frank Lund and Major Mace, decide to build a pirate ship of all things here in New Brighton? Well, it's generally thought that New Brighton, positioned on the tip of the Wirral and easily accessible from the Irish Sea, was once a hive of smuggling and also the practice of wrecking, where locals would plunder any valuables from onboard ships that had run aground on the shore here. As we look across the wide open Mersey estuary towards the port and city of Liverpool, New Brighton here had a notorious reputation for the various illegal activities that took place on its coast. In fact, Smuggling was so commonplace here that there developed an expansive network of underground tunnels used by smugglers to hide their loot from prying eyes, with the oldest tunnels underneath the town here thought to date back over 400 years. Later on in history, some of those smuggling tunnels were redeveloped to be used as underground munitions factories in the Second World War, and later nightclubs and other facilities that are said to link with the town's famous Palace Amusement Arcade. The tunnels are occasionally open to the public too, and so would make a fascinating addition to a tour of New Brighton's illustrious history. But as we've now made our way off the town's impressive beach, we'll begin our walk along what is touted as the UK's longest seaside promenade, which curves its way around the northeastern corner of the Wirral Peninsula. Looking at this map, we can get a better idea of New Brighton's location, covering the rather right-angled northeastern corner of the Wirral about four miles north of Birkenhead. Now before we take a look back at the town's waterfront and its illustrious seaside heritage, New Brighton was also once the home of an enormous landmark, a huge observation tower not only easily visible from Liverpool across the water, but which once stood as the tallest building in Great Britain. Opened in the final years of the 19th century, the New Brighton Tower once stood atop this mound of grass towering with a height of 567 feet or 173 meters, which afforded incredible views of what is today the Merseyside region, and the big blue sea stretching out into the distance. When it was open, it cost just one shilling to take a trip up to the top of the tower, and hundreds of thousands of people would come to visit New Brighton just for the chance of experiencing what was one of Britain's great landmarks. Sadly, however, the outbreak of the First World War in 1914 meant that the public were banned from going up to the top of the tower, and with a lower income, maintenance of the tower began to be neglected. By 1919, the owners of the mighty New Brighton Tower could no longer afford to keep it, and so it was dismantled and sold off for scrap metal, meaning that the Wirral lost one of its most spectacular landmarks. However, not all trace of the tower was gone. At the base of the observation tower and on top of the grassy knoll which we just looked at, there was a large ballroom, 
said to have been one of the finest in the country for its day. Even after the loss of the tower above it, the ballroom continued to operate, and later on in its history, it played host to many famous musical acts, including none other than the Beatles, who played at the Tower Ballroom here in New Brighton on 27 occasions between 1961 and 1963, the most times they played at any one venue in Britain apart from the famous Cavern Club. As we pass by Pier House, formerly the Royal Ferry Hotel built in 1850, the Tower Ballroom that stood just a few steps away was eventually lost to history too, damaged heavily by fire in 1969, and so it was demolished, leaving only the prominent grass mound as a memory of what was once a famous spot in New Brighton. The legacy of the New Brighton Tower and its famous ballroom remains strong to this day, and it goes to show just how popular a place New Brighton has been for so long. But where did the hundreds of thousands of visitors coming to New Brighton come from? Well, most would arrive right here, where there was once a 600 foot long pier that existed between 1867 and 1977, and on which droves of visitors from across the water in Liverpool would set foot before a great day out by the sea here. But the legacy of seaside tourism in New Brighton goes back a little further than that. New Brighton, with its wide open beaches, profited significantly from the growth in popularity of seaside holidays in the 19th century. Initially, this area was fairly undeveloped, but in 1830, the land here was bought by a merchant from Liverpool by the name of James Atherton, who sought to convert it into an exclusive seaside resort for the upper classes in much the same vein as the seaside resort of Brighton on England's south coast. So that's where New Brighton gets its name from. But by the late 19th century, this area had been transformed from an exclusive seaside retreat for the wealthy into a real destination for the masses, catering to the people of the fast-growing city of Liverpool and the many industrial towns across Lancashire. As well as taking in the sea, sand and hopefully some sun too, there were countless attractions to enjoy in New Brighton. We've already mentioned the Observation Tower, but there were also amusement arcades and of course theatres to enjoy shows. Here, we're walking towards the Floral Pavilion Theatre, which in its current rebuilt guise dates from 2008, but which was originally opened back in 1913 as an open-air summer theatre, later topped with a roof for year-round performances. Described as one of the finest theatres in the kingdom in its heyday, the rebuilt Floral Pavilion is the last active major theatre in New Brighton, continuing the long tradition of live theatre in the area. And just outside the theatre's front doors, there also stands this delightful statue of a dog, which stands as a monument to the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association, which was founded back in 1934 in Wallasey here on the northeastern corner of the Wirral. The guide dog statue was relocated to stand in front of the Floral Pavilion when the theatre was rebuilt, and it's just one of a number of spots in New Brighton that has undergone significant refurbishment in recent years, as the town has shifted in scope from its days as a large-scale tourist attraction. We'll talk more about how New Brighton's fortunes have fallen and risen over the last few decades, but on the impressive marine promenade here opposite the port of Liverpool, we find a colourful statue of a mermaid, known as the Mermaid of Memories. This mermaid is one of six you'll find that stand on New Brighton's two mile long promenade, and they were placed on the seafront here in 2017 in memory of the local legend of the Black Rock Mermaid, who is said to have appeared to a local sailor just off the coast here back in the 18th century. The mermaids on New Brighton's promenade have fast found their footing as popular local landmarks, adding a splendid splash of colour to the seafront here. However, it's not just tourism and easy day trips that New Brighton is known for. As we mentioned at the start of our walk, New Brighton's position on the tip of the Wirral and at the mouth of the Mersey estuary has long been highly advantageous, initially for the smugglers who sought to offload their goods into the country as quickly and as secretly as they could. Later in history, however, New Brighton would play its part in the scope of a couple of major wars. In the Second World War, 
The wide open Mersey estuary was considered a potentially vulnerable position to any amphibious invasion attempted by Nazi Germany, especially if the Nazis had ever carried out their supposed plans to occupy the island of Ireland just across the sea from here. In preparation for an invasion that thankfully never came, a number of defensive Mornsel forts were built in the water just outside the estuary, while the estuary itself had a fortunately inbuilt defence in the form of New Brighton's old pier. The pier, by extending out 600 feet from the coast here, was considered to have been useful to squeeze any enemy ships into a tighter passage towards Liverpool than otherwise would have been the case. But long before the Second World War, and before the pier or even the first seaside resort here was built, New Brighton became the home of a major coastal fortification in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. In front of us here, we're approaching the extensive Fort Perch Rock, a huge defence battery that was built in the late 1820s to protect the increasingly significant port of Liverpool, with Britain still wary of invasion from abroad after years of conflict with Napoleonic France. Now before this fort was built, there had been coastal defences over on the Liverpool side of the Mersey, but with the expansion of its docks, land was at a premium, and so it was decided that a fort would be built on the tip of the Wirral here. The strategic advantage provided by the fort's position is evident, but with the war with Napoleon at an end by the time it began construction, the most pressing use for the fort was that it took over a part of New Brighton's beach that, as we mentioned earlier, had long been used by the locals for wrecking, where they lured in ships heading towards Liverpool to then plunder its cargo. Completed in 1829, Fort Perch Rock was designed to be capable of holding a military garrison of as many as a hundred men, and along with mighty walls that would make it almost impossible to overthrow, it was fitted with a range of powerful defensive guns to fire towards any enemy ships approaching too close. Remodelled a number of times over the years, Fort Perch Rock actually spent most of its life without seeing any major military action. The only really notable engagement came in the First World War, when the fort fired towards a Norwegian ship attempting to enter the Mersey, though the gunners here actually missed the ship and nearly hit somebody's house over in Hightown on the other side of the estuary. In the Second World War, though it was readied for any amphibious invasion by the Nazis, Fort Perch Rock didn't see any conflict, although rather cleverly, its defensive walls were painted to look like a quaint tourist resort, with lawns and tea shops, so as to fool any potential invading ships. Ultimately, Fort Perch Rock was decommissioned in 1956, but it remains in good condition as a museum and tourist attraction in New Brighton today. Fort Perch Rock still looks out to sea here on the very northeastern corner of the Wirral Peninsula, where we can also see a lighthouse standing just out in the water. New Brighton's lighthouse, originally known as Perch Rock Lighthouse, is another famous local landmark, built in 1827 during the development of Fort Perch Rock. However, the history of the lighthouse here goes back even further with the first tower built all the way back in 1683 to help guide ships past Perch Rock here and into the River Mersey to offload their goods. Of course, in the 18th and 19th centuries, Liverpool rose to become arguably the most significant port in Britain and perhaps even the world, and so the lighthouse here in New Brighton worked overtime to keep ships passing in and out of the Mersey safe, and it remained in use all the way until 1973, when it was eventually decommissioned although the lighthouse has been partially reactivated since 2016, although simply for decorative purposes on the Wirral's waterfront. But speaking of the waterfront, we've been saying that New Brighton rose to prominence as a seaside resort for tourists from inland industrial towns looking to enjoy a day on the beach. But owing to the heavy industrial activity taking place over in Liverpool, the water here isn't exactly the cleanest in the world, and as such, a lot of the skinny dipping took place in New Brighton's huge old Lido, the premier destination in the town for decades. Now the body of water we're walking past here isn't the old Lido, but rather Marine Lake, which was added to the town's seafront in the early 1930s. As for the old New Brighton Lido, it existed just along the promenade next to Marine Lake, 
and was opened back in 1934 to much fanfare. At the time of its opening, New Brighton's Lido was the largest open-air swimming pool in the country, capable of hosting over 6,000 people at once, many splashing about in the often packed salt water pool, while the rest sunbathed or played a variety of sports. The Lido was such a big hit that over a million people visited within the first four months of its opening, and it remained pretty much packed to the rafters every summer from 1934 until 1990, when a huge storm devastated the pool, causing more than £4 million worth of damages, and so it was decided shortly afterwards that the famous destination would be demolished. New Brighton's famous Lido was replaced by the modern Marine Point Leisure Centre that stands opposite us across Marine Lake. But the loss of the outdoor swimming pool from the resort has marked a major change in what New Brighton offers to visitors. Overlooking Marine Lake and the King's Parade here in blue and white meanwhile, we can see the New Palace Arcade, an amusement arcade that was another feature of the town seafront added in the 1930s, designed in a striking Art Deco style. At the minute, however, the Palace Arcade is looking a little bit worse for wear. But as a famous landmark of the waterfront, it has survived recent plans for demolition as New Brighton continues to make various redevelopment efforts along its promenade. Now, while New Brighton has a history of being one of the most popular seaside resorts in the region, its fortunes have declined somewhat since its heyday in the early 20th century. As was the case with coastal resorts right across the country, the popularity of seaside holidays in Britain declined in the aftermath of the Second World War, and then further still, with the advent of affordable foreign travel to warm countries like Spain. New Brighton in particular was hit by these developments in the mid-20th century, but it still had a major attraction in the form of its tower ballroom, until that was destroyed in 1969. Ferries across the Mersey to New Brighton's pier came to an end in the early 1970s, and so the only way to access New Brighton from Liverpool and Lancashire was by driving through the Mersey Tunnel under the river or by catching a train to the town station from central Liverpool. As such, the era of immense mass tourism in New Brighton came to an end, and the closure of the ever-popular Lido in 1990 was a damaging blow to the town. That being said, however, New Brighton is now in the process of redeveloping its historic tourist industry with new attractions like the rebuilt Floral Pavilion Theatre, and many delightful landmarks like the Pirate Ship, Mermaid Trail, and Fort Perch Rock, which we've visited on our walk so far. In the summer, meanwhile, Marine Lake is becoming a centre of various new waterborne activities, where you can enjoy everything from pedalos to wakeboarding and more, reminiscent of the action-packed Lido that once stood just a few yards away. Now, as well as rekindling some of its lost glory, New Brighton is also a great place to visit if you're in Liverpool for a bit of a break from the busy metropolis, and also to get a view of the city from afar, with the views that we saw at the start of our walk from across the Mersey really putting the modern city's sprawling size into perspective. And of course, as one of Britain's major metropolises, the fortunes of Liverpool have an effect on the surrounding region, including the Wirral here which today finds itself as an area where many people live and then commute to work in Liverpool. Walking away from the seafront now, we'll make our way into the streets that make up inland New Brighton, a place which is home to as many as 15,000 permanent residents today. This is Waterloo Road, where we're passing by one of New Brighton's many murals. This one, painted in 2020 to depict the history of shipwrecks and the practice of wrecking in New Brighton. During that era, a common saying in the local area was Seeking's finding and finding's keeping, referring to how ships that ran aground here were looted after having been lured into New Brighton's coast by locals lighting fires on the hillsides here. Away from the seafront, New Brighton is home to as many as 28 murals in the town centre here, most depicting elements of the local history and culture and having been painted in the last few years as a brand new feature of this historic seaside resort. We'll see a few more of New Brighton's murals as we continue walking through the town centre towards St James's Parish Church, where we'll end our walk in about five minutes' time. Continuing up Waterloo Road for the meantime, as well as its modern murals, 
New Brighton is a town that's also known in the world of photography, as having been the subject of a notable book, The Last Resort, published in 1986 by Martin Parr, which included a range of photos depicting life in New Brighton in the 1980s with a satirical eye. Though some deemed it controversial, for what some considered to be voyeurism on holidaymakers at the time. Either way, the book captures the bustling but at times run-down face of New Brighton's seaside industry at the time. But the town is much changed since those days, with the book's photographer, Martin Parr, saying that New Brighton appears to have been somewhat gentrified now. Certainly, in its role as a bit of a commuter town for people working in Liverpool, streets like Waterloo Road here have taken on the appearance of a typical suburb, while there's also renewed focus on the town's inland streets as the tourist industry has become somewhat less significant in the local economy. At the top of Waterloo Road now, we're passing by another mural, said to be the largest and most colourful in town, as it encompasses an entire building, designed in a fetching graffiti style. The murals that adorn the town's buildings today really do bring a delightful new side to New Brighton. And though we won't be able to catch all of the murals on this walk, I would absolutely encourage anybody visiting this seaside resort to wander into the town centre to take a look at some of these wonderful modern artworks. And hopefully, more towns around the country take after New Brighton, with murals depicting their own community too. Now, we find ourselves on Victoria Road, which serves as New Brighton's effective high street, lined with shops and pubs. Initially, this road came to prominence as the centre of shopping in the town, owing to the fact that the ferry terminal and pier were just a short walk away. And so as well as exploring the seafront, many day trippers would wander into the town centre, where many new shops were eventually built in the late 19th century to cater to them. As New Brighton rose in stature in the early 20th century with its famous tower, ballroom and Lido, Victoria Road in particular was packed with must-visit shops, cafes, arcades and more, as well as a variety of establishments that catered to locals in the winter months too. Like the rest of the resort, the deluxe shopping sphere on Victoria Road began to fall away in the 1970s, and many long-running establishments were closed, with most shops on the street now serving the needs of locals through the year, while most tourist infrastructure is located around the seafront. But as a town of around 15,000 people, New Brighton extends far inland, and it's effectively an exterior suburb of the much larger town of Wallasey, which occupies almost all of the northeastern corner of the Wirral Peninsula. As part of a major built-up area, however, it's very easy to get to New Brighton wherever you're coming from with direct trains running from the centre of Liverpool throughout the day to the town station just at the end of this road, and it only takes about 25 minutes from the centre of the city to this seaside spot. As I hope you'll agree from this walk, New Brighton is a captivating spot on the Wirral, complete not only with an enthralling history that encompasses smugglers, wreckers, wars and more, but also an impressive seafront and beach with gorgeous views across the Mersey all of which is in the process of being brought back towards the glory days of when this was one of Britain's most famous seaside resorts. But having now made our way along the promenade and through the town centre past a number of New Brighton's most famous landmarks, there's just one building left for us to take a look at, St James's Church, the local parish church that dates back to 1856. This church was originally built as the place of worship for the wealthy residents of James Atherton's elegant new seaside resort, and it remains in use today as one of a number of churches in New Brighton, alongside those belonging to the town's Catholic, United and other religious communities. And so it's here as we look up at the church that we come to the end of our walk around New Brighton. Thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're looking forward to visiting New Brighton for yourself sometime soon.